The White House has argued, correctly, that the transcripts cannot be judged by reading only a few key quotes. We could not begin in this hour to read you the bulk of the 1,308 pages. But we can look at some extended segments of the transcript, some significant passages during what may be the most controversial of those conversations. We've asked three CBS News correspondents to read that transcript to us. Barry Serafin will read the words of President Nixon. Bob Schieffer, the words of John Dean. And Nelson Benton, the words of H.R. Haldeman. We should point out, however, that since we do not have the tapes, only transcripts, we have no way of knowing how those words were spoken originally. We do not have the inflections. Now, was the president, or Haldeman, or Dean, questioning in tone, or emphatic in agreement, or musing over the possible uh, suggestions that were made? But we can't tell from just the cold words in print. That's one of the reasons that Judiciary Committee members say they want to hear the tapes. If, as the president argues, some of these passages are ambiguous, and they certainly seem to be, the lack of inflections may be partly responsible. The transcript we will hear read is from that meeting of March 21st, and overseeing this modest exercise in dramatic reading is our senior correspondent on Watergate Beat, Daniel Shore. March 21st, 1973, must rank as the turning point for the president in his post-Watergate history. It was a day that John Dean, seeing the cover-up start to unravel, briefed Mr. Nixon at length on what had gone before and discussed with him and H.R. Haldeman where to go from there. The immediate problem was Howard Hunt's demand for $120,000, and that led to a wide-ranging discussion of hush money and clemency and how to deal with investigations. The cover-up indictment handed up this March 1st cites that meeting as one overt act in a cover-up conspiracy. The president, conceding ambiguous language, has denied nonetheless any illegal intentions on his part, saying that he was only probing. The meeting in the Oval Office lasted from 10.12 to 11.55 a.m. The White House transcript with some deletions marked unintelligible runs 79 pages, and these are the excerpts. John Dean speaks. The reason that I thought we ought to talk this morning is because in our conversations, we, I have the impression that you don't know everything I know, and it makes it very difficult for you to make some judgments that only you can make on some of these things, and I thought that... In other words, I have to know why you feel that we shouldn't unravel something? Let me give you my overall first. In other words, your judgment as to where it stands and where we will go. I think that there is no doubt about the seriousness of the problem we've got. We have a cancer within, close to the presidency, that is growing. It is growing daily, it's compounded, growing geometrically now, because it compounds itself. That will be clear if I, you know, explain some of the details of why it is. Basically, it is because, one, we are being blackmailed. Two, people are going to start perjuring themselves very quickly that have not had to perjure themselves to protect other people in the line. And there is no assurance... That that won't bust? That that won't bust. Then Dean recounted how the Watergate conspiracy was born, starting with Haldeman's instructions to set up, quote, a legitimate intelligence campaign operation, unquote. The recruiting of Gordon Liddy, who had been involved in the Ellsberg break-in, John Mitchell's initial rejection of the plan and the pressures on him to approve it, the involvement of White House and campaign officials, perjury by Jeb Magruder, and possibly others. Again, Dean speaks. Now, what has happened post-June 17? I was under pretty clear instructions not to investigate this, but this could have been disastrous on the electorate if all hell had broken loose. I worked on a theory of containment. Sure. To try to hold it right where it was. Right. There is no doubt that I was totally aware of what the Bureau was doing at all times. I was totally aware of what the grand jury was doing. I knew what witnesses were going to be called. I knew what they were asked. I had to. Why did Peterson play the game so straight with us? Because Peterson is a soldier. He kept me informed. He told me when we had problems, where we had problems, and the like. He believes in you, and he believes in the administration. This administration has made him. I don't think he has done anything improper, but he did make sure that the investigation was narrowed down to the very, very fine criminal thing, which was a break for us. There is no doubt about it. The president expressed puzzlement about why the failure of the investigation to go further why Haldeman hadn't been questioned in that investigation. Now, Dean said, the Watergate defendants had counsel and were apparently prepared to ride these things out, but problems were arising. 
All right, then they started making demands. We have to have attorney's fees. We don't have any money ourselves, and you're asking us to take this through the election. All right, so arrangements were made through Mitchell initiating it. And I was present in discussions where these guys had to be taken care of. Their attorney's fees had to be done. Kalmbach was brought in. Kalmbach raised some cash. They put that under the cover of a Cuban committee, I suppose? Well, they had a Cuban committee, and they had uh, some of it was given to Hunt's lawyer, who in turn passed it out. You know, when Hunt's wife was flying to Chicago with $10,000, she was actually, I understand after the fact now, was going to pass that money to one of the Cubans to meet him in Chicago and pass it to somebody there. There's an unintelligible remark that the president says, but I would certainly keep that cover for whatever it is worth. That's the most troublesome post thing, because one, Bob is involved in that. Two, John is involved in that. Three, I am involved in that. Four, Mitchell is involved in that. And that is an obstruction of justice. Dean warned of a, quote, continual blackmail operation by Hunt, Liddy, and the Cubans, unquote. Hunt demanding $120,000 for expenses and attorney's fees, threatening to expose seamy things that would put John Ehrlichman in jail. Dean referred to the death of Hunt's wife in an airline crash. The president says, great sadness. As a matter of fact, there was a discussion with somebody about Hunt's problem on account of his wife. And I said, of course, commutation could be considered on the basis of his wife's death. And that is the only conversation I ever had in that light. Right. So that is it. That is the extent of the knowledge. So where are the soft spots on this? Well, first of all, there is the problem of the continued blackmail, which will not only go on now, but it will go on while these people are in prison. And it will compound the obstruction of justice situation. It will cost money. It is dangerous. People around here are not pros at this sort of thing. This is the sort of thing mafia people can do, washing money, getting clean money, things like that. We just don't know about those things because we are not criminals and we are not used to dealing in that business. That's right. It is a tough thing to know how to do. Maybe it takes a gang to do that. That's right. There is a real problem as to whether we could even do it. Plus, there is a real problem in raising money. Mitchell has been working on raising some money. He is one of the ones with the most to lose. But there is no denying the fact that the White House and Ehrlichman, Haldeman, and Dean are involved in some of the early money decisions. How much money do you need? I would say that these people are going to cost a million dollars over the next two years. We could get that on the money if you need the money you could get that you could get a million dollars you could get it in cash i know where it could be gotten it is not easy but it could be done but the question is who the hell would handle it any ideas on that that's right well i think that is something that mitchell ought to be charged with i would think so too and get some pros to help him let me say there shouldn't be a lot of people running around getting money a moment later the president goes on to say it is going to be checks cash money etc how, if that ever comes out, are you going to handle it? Is the Cuban committee an obstruction of justice if they want to help? Well, they have priests in it. Would that give a little bit of cover? That would give some for the Cubans and possibly Hunt. Dean said that no price had been too high to avoid a blow-up before the election, but he warned of the growing cancer, citing the possibility that Eagle Krog might confess his perjury. The president says he might be able to. I'm just trying to think. Perjury is an awful hard rap to prove. If he could just say that I... Well, go ahead. Well, so that is one perjury. Mitchell and Magruder are potential perjurers. There is always a possibility of any one of these individuals blowing. Hunt, Liddy. Liddy is in jail right now, serving his time and having a good time right now. I think Liddy, in his own bizarre way, the strongest of all of them. So there is that possibility. Your major guy to keep under control is Hunt? That is right. A moment later, the president says, just looking at the immediate problem, don't you think you have to handle Hunt's financial situation damn soon? I think that that is, I, I talked with Mitchell about that last night, and... It seems to me we have to keep the cap on the bottle that much, or we don't have any options. That's right. Either that or it all blows right now. That's the question. And then a little later, Dean says... What really bothers me in this is the growing situation. As I say, it is growing because of the continued need to provide support for the Watergate people who are going to hold us up for everything we've got and the need for some people to perjure themselves as they go down the road here. If this thing ever blows, then we're in a cover-up situation. I think it would be extremely damaging to you and the... Sure, the whole concept of administration justice, which we cannot have. That is what really troubles me. For example, what happens if it starts breaking and they do find a criminal case against to Haldeman, a Dean, a Mitchell, an Ehrlichman, that is... If it really comes down to that, we would have to, there's an unintelligible remark, some of the men. That's right. I am coming down to what I really think, is that Bob and John and John Mitchell and I can sit down and spend a day or however long to figure out one. 
how this can be carved away from you so that it does not damage you or the presidency. It just can't. You are not involved in it, and it is something you shouldn't. That is true. I know, sir. I can just tell from our conversation that these things that that you have these these are things that you have no knowledge of. You certainly can. Buggings, etc. Let me say I'm keenly aware of the fact Colson et al. were doing their best to get information as we went along, but they all knew very well they were supposed to comply with the law. There was no question about that. And the president goes on to say, so what you really come to is what we do. Let's suppose that you and Haldeman and Ehrlichman and Mitchell say we can't hold this. What then are you going to say? What are you going to put out after it? Complete disclosure, isn't that the best way to do it?